during that time, there are Jewish writings that were done, mm -hmm. and it's actually because of these writings that we know that they yearned so deeply for to hear God's voice mm -hmm. again. Mm -hmm. These these apocryphal um, uh, books don't claim to be God's word. Within the pages of ancient manuscripts, the apocryphal texts offer a portal into a stormy era of Jewish history. But shockingly, some of these sacred writings failed to make it into the Bible. What mysteries lie within the pages of these old manuscripts, and why were they excluded from the Bible? Join us as we explore the first and second books of Maccabees. Unveiling the Mystery of the Apocrypha The term apocrypha finds its roots in the Greek word apokryphos, meaning hidden or to hide. Over time, apocryphal has come to be associated with falsehood, when discussing the Apocrypha, particularly from a Protestant evangelical perspective, it refers to additional books that are not considered part of the canon, unlike in some Christian traditions, such as Catholicism and Eastern Orthodoxy. Unlike the New Testament, which has a universally accepted canon among major Christian traditions, the Apocrypha raises questions and debates. While there is consensus on the 27-book New Testament canon, the Apocrypha presents varying counts, ranging from 12 additional books in some traditions to even more in Eastern Orthodoxy. Around 420 BC, the Old Testament wraps up with the words of the prophet Malachi. Then there's a sort of gap, a quiet spell, lasting 400 years. During this time, there's a sense of anticipation among the Jewish people. They're keenly aware that they're missing a prophet, someone to guide them as in the days of old. John the Baptist, who emerges later, is sometimes seen as a link to this prophetic tradition, bridging the gap between Malachi and his own time. Imagine those 400 years as a time of waiting, of longing to hear from God again. The Jewish community of the time felt this deeply. They knew they were awaiting the Messiah promised in Deuteronomy, yet they also sensed their lack of complete understanding. They were hungry for guidance, for divine direction, but the heavens seemed silent. In the absence of a recognized prophet, the Jewish people turned to their writings. These writings, known as the apocryphal books, aren't generally considered divine revelation like the Torah, but they offer glimpses into the mindset of the people during those silent years. Take, for example, the account in Maccabees, where the Jews, upon reclaiming their temple from pagan defilement, find themselves unsure of how to proceed. The altar, once sacred to Yahweh, had been defiled by the pagans. Uncertain of what to do, they decide to preserve the stones and await the word of a prophet who would guide them. This illustrates the deep yearning of the Jewish people for divine instruction and guidance during this period of silence, a yearning that would eventually find fulfillment with the arrival of Jesus whom they believed to be the awaited Messiah and the ultimate revealer of God's will. During those 400 years when God's voice seemed silent, the Apocrypha was penned by Jewish writers who longed to hear from Him once more. Though these writings don't claim to be the direct words of God, they hold immense historical significance. They provide a window into that era and shed light on the transition from the Judaism of the Old Testament to the Judaism practiced during the Second Temple period after the Jews returned from exile. The Second Temple Judaism, as it evolved, was characterized by a fervent desire for a prophet and the awaited Messiah. The apocryphal texts offer insights into how this longing shaped the religious landscape and prepared the way for Jesus' arrival. But are these writings considered reliable historical sources? Well, some are indeed regarded as accurate depictions of the times, offering valuable insights into the mindset of the people. However, others resemble what Christians might call fictional tales or parables rather than strict historical records. For instance, the story of Tobit is often seen more as a moral tale or allegory than a factual account. Similarly, Judith's tale doesn't always align with known historical events. So, while parts of the Apocrypha may reflect Jewish aspirations and yearnings through storytelling, other sections serve as genuine historical records, providing valuable glimpses into the past. When did these writings become part of the Bible, and whose interpretation of the Bible were they included in? From oral tradition to written canon. In the early days of the church, 
there was a lot of debate about which books should be considered part of the New Testament. As soon as the church began, around 20 years later, some of the books of the New Testament, like Galatians and James, were already being written, probably around A.D. 48. Now during this time the church was already spreading the teachings of the gospel orally, but it was only starting to put them down in writing in the 40s. The gospels likely began around the same period. So, various churches had different lists of books they considered part of the New Testament. They were pretty much in agreement about the gospels and Paul's letters, but there was some disagreement and uncertainty about a few other books that came afterward. The earliest recorded instance of the complete list of books that we now recognize in the New Testament was in the year 367. Athanasius, who was the bishop of Alexandria in Egypt, wrote a letter to the pastors of various churches. In this letter, he not only informed them about the date of Easter, which could vary from year to year, but he also listed the specific books that should be considered part of the New Testament, as well as the books of the Old Testament. This marks the first time we have a definitive list of these books. This significant event took place around 367 AD, providing clarity on the composition of the New Testament. Furthermore, a similar confirmation occurred in the West, specifically in Carthage, during a church council in 393 AD. So it took several hundred years for the precise contents of the New Testament to be established and widely recognized within the Christian community. As far as we know, there isn't a recorded list of books that were being used, at least not one that has survived. But the majority of what was considered part of the New Testament was widely agreed upon. There's an interesting story about how the Gospels and Paul's letters were gathered together. Legend has it that a man named Onesimus collected Paul's letters, including the one to Philemon, which played a significant role in Onesimus gaining his freedom and eventually becoming a bishop. So, there was little disagreement in the early church about Paul's letters, the Gospels, and the Book of Acts. However, there were some uncertainties about the letters that came after Paul's. This could be due to geographical reasons, like the distance between where some letters were written and where they were received. For example, Hebrews is believed to have been written in Italy near Rome, while Revelation was likely written in Asia, what we now call Turkey. So, it's understandable that these letters might not have reached all corners of Europe in time to be included in some lists. Nonetheless, the core of the New Testament was quite clear to most early Christians. It wasn't until the late 4th and early 5th centuries, around 367 AD and 393 AD respectively, that the exact list of books was definitively stated in the Western Church. Athanasius, a bishop from Alexandria in Egypt, also mentioned the same books of the Old Testament that are found in the Hebrew Bible. Interestingly, in Egypt, where Athanasius was from, many apocryphal books were collected and used alongside the traditional scriptures. This continued for centuries, even after Athanasius' declaration. It wasn't until the time of the Reformation that the use of these apocryphal books started to be questioned among Christians. The apocryphal books were in use for a significant period, spanning about a thousand years or so. However, there was an acknowledgement of their specialty. Take, for example, an ancient Latin Bible. Its origins are unclear, likely translated by multiple individuals with varying levels of skill. In the 380s, Damasus, the Bishop of Rome, recognized the need for a more accurate translation. He enlisted Jerome, known for his proficiency in Latin, to undertake this task. Jerome relocated to Bethlehem and sought out the Jewish scholars for the books. Interestingly, they did not possess the apocryphal texts. Jerome expressed reluctance to include them, but Damasus insisted on their inclusion. Despite this, there lingered a sense that these texts might not hold the same weight as the others. Even today, the Catholic Church refers to them as deuterocanonical, implying a secondary status compared to the rest of the canon. In contrast, we commonly refer to them as apocrypha, meaning hidden. They refer to these books as deuterocanonical, which means second canon, suggesting they're considered of lesser importance. 
Catholics in particular, are less inclined to use them, especially when writing material intended for broader audiences, including non-Catholics. This acknowledgement of their lower status has been recognized throughout Christian history. During the Reformation, Protestants placed the apocryphal books between the Old and New Testaments, indicating they saw value in reading them but didn't consider them scripture. However, over time, the influence of figures like Martin Luther led to a shift away from including the Apocrypha in Protestant Bibles. The American Bible Society further popularized this trend in the early 1800s by removing the Apocrypha to increase the production of Bibles. Interestingly, some Protestant Bibles still include the Apocrypha, but it's less common nowadays. There's been a renewal of interest, with some modern Protestant editions reintroducing these books. However, Catholics and Orthodox Christians have consistently used the Apocrypha and continue to do so. Anglicans show some lightness in their usage, but overall, it's predominantly Catholics and Orthodox Christians who still incorporate these texts into their Bible readings. In any case, it's worth taking a look at the historical information found in books like 1 and 2 Maccabees. Unveiling 1 Maccabees Warren Maccabees was likely penned by a Jewish author around 100 BC after the Jewish kingdom regained independence. The story unfolds roughly a hundred years after Judea fell to the Greeks, led by Alexander the Great. At this time, Judea was part of the Greek Seleucid Empire, following the division of Alexander's vast conquests. The book recounts the efforts of the Greek ruler, Antiochus IV Epiphanes, to suppress Jewish religious customs, sparking a rebellion against Seleucid authority. It spans from 175 to 134 BC, capturing the entirety of the revolt. Central to the narrative is the role of Mattathias's family, particularly his sons, Judas, Jonathan, and Simon, as well as his grandson, John Hyrcanus. These figures emerge as helpful in the salvation of the Jewish people during this violent period. The book emphasizes divine intervention, attributing the deliverance of the Jewish community to God's providence. In its teachings, the book upholds traditional Jewish beliefs, devoid of later doctrines found in texts like 2 Maccabees. It serves as a testament to the resilience of the Jewish faith and the courage of those who stood against oppression. In the opening chapter, we witness the mighty Alexander the Great claiming Judea's lands. But as time unfolds, he passes away, leaving his legacy to be carried on by the Seleucid ruler, Antiochus Epiphanes. Antiochus, fueled by conquest, marches forth into Egypt, leaving Judea behind. With seemingly little aid from the Jewish community, he triumphs over the Ptolemaic realm and seizes control of Jerusalem. There, he commits a terrible act by plundering the sacred artifacts from the temple and inflicting widespread harm upon the Jewish population. To tighten his grip, Antiochus imposes heavy taxes and fortifies the city with a great castle, solidifying his authority over the land. Antiochus, seeking to tighten his grip on power, initiates measures to suppress Jewish customs. His actions include defiling the temple with an idol, aiming to instill fear and assert his dominance. Antiochus issues decrees forbidding essential Jewish rites, like circumcision and possession of scriptures, punishable by death. Furthermore, he forbids the observance of the Sabbath and the offering of sacrifices in the Jerusalem temple, compelling Jewish leaders to partake in idol worship. While primarily targeting leaders, his enforcement leads to the death of some Jews, including children, as a deterrent to dissent. Additionally, Antiochus introduces Hellenistic practices, such as gymnasiums, into Jerusalem, discouraging circumcision, which would be clear in such settings. These actions reflect his cruel tactics to impose Hellenistic culture and erode Jewish identity. Mattathias rallies the people to wage a sacred war against the invaders, and his three sons embark on a military campaign against them. In one instance, a thousand Jews, including men, women, and children, suffer a devastating loss to Antiochus when they refuse to fight on the Sabbath day. This incident prompts the other Jews to realize the necessity of defending themselves, even on the Sabbath, when under attack. 
In 165 BC, the temple is freed and rededicated, allowing for the resumption of ritual sacrifices. To commemorate this victory, Judas Maccabee and his brothers establish the festival of Hanukkah. Seeking to oust the Greeks from power, Judas pursues an alliance with the Roman Republic. Following Judas, his brother Jonathan assumes leadership, serving as both high priest and seeking support from Rome and Sparta. Next, Simon takes over, holding the dual roles of high priest and prince of Israel. Despite not being of David's lineage, Simon and his successors establish the Hasmonean dynasty. Simon leads the nation toward an era of peace and prosperity until he is assassinated by Ptolemy's agents, who were appointed as governors by the Greeks. His son, John Hyrcanus, succeeds him. The term Maccabee likely means hammer and originally referred specifically to the leader of the rebellion, Judas, who was the third son of the priest Mattathias. Another interpretation suggests that Maccabee could have originated from the battle cry of the revolt, Me Kumocha Ba'elem Hashem, meaning, Who is like you among the heavenly powers, Hashem? This phrase is found in Exodus 15. In Hebrew, the first letters of these four words form the acronym MKBY, which became closely associated with the revolt. The most renowned fighter of the rebellion was Judah the Maccabee. Over time, the term Maccabee came to be used for his brothers as well, leading to the title of the book. Scholars suggest that in the original Hebrew, the phrase used to describe the horrible abomination might have sounded similar to Lord of Heaven, possibly referring to an image or altar dedicated to Zeus. Faith amidst cultural turmoil. The opening chapter of 2nd Maccabees serves as a reflection from the author, written many years after the events took place. He aims to remind people to stay faithful to God's teachings despite the influence of Greek culture. Starting with a reference to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the author encourages wholehearted worship and obedience to God's laws. He urges his readers to recall recent events, like the temple's cleansing and the celebration of the feast, which symbolized trust in God and detachment from materialism and modern culture. The writer emphasizes the importance of observing the temple's purification, likening it to the Feast of Booths, which Nehemiah observed. He mentions the use of fire and oil in the festivities, symbolizing the dedication of the first fruits to God. In the following chapter, Jeremiah, a prophet, is highlighted for guiding the people in adhering to God's laws amidst various worldly distractions. Upon the Jews' return to Jerusalem around 538 BC, the reconstruction of the temple took place, but the ark was not reinstated. Jeremiah 3 emphasizes the need for the people to rely on their faith in God rather than on physical symbols like the ark. He stresses that their devotion should stem from inner strength, not external objects. The author emphasizes that the true source of faith is not the ark itself, but the presence of the Lord, symbolized by his cloud and fire among his people. He draws parallels between the current temple and Solomon's original construction, as well as the efforts of Nehemiah and later figures like Judas Maccabees in preserving Jewish heritage. Concluding the introduction, the writer emphasizes that the essence of their faith lies in the Lord, not in material symbols. He previews the forthcoming narrative, which will recount how Greek interference threatened Jewish beliefs, leading to the desecration of the temple. This act spurred Judas Maccabees and his brothers to defend their faith and restore purity to the temple. The writer aims to simplify the narrative for easier comprehension, focusing on the preservation of faith amidst external challenges. Chapter 3 begins by mentioning Onias, who is depicted as a virtuous high priest with a strong aversion to wickedness. The narrative then shifts focus to Simon of Bilgal, whose actions trigger a series of unfortunate events. Following a disagreement with Onias, Simon betrays the trust by disclosing the considerable wealth stored in Jerusalem's treasury to Apollonius of Tarsus the Greek governor of the neighboring region. Apollonius, in turn, informs King Antiochus III the Great about the riches. In response, the king dispatches his chief minister, Heliodorus, 
to confiscate the treasury under the pretense of visiting various cities in the area. Upon arriving in Jerusalem, Heliodorus inquires about the treasury, only to be met with Onias's firm assertion that the funds are designated for the welfare of widows, orphans, and other vulnerable members of society. Onias emphasizes the moral obligation to protect these funds, as stealing from the needy is a violation of God's law. Despite Onias's pleas, Heliodorus disregards his words and proceeds to seize the funds, causing widespread distress among the people. Onias, overwhelmed with grief, falls physically ill, prompting prayers and supplications from the priests and citizens for divine intervention. Their prayers are answered when Heliodorus and his men encounter a supernatural manifestation, terrifying some into fleeing and incapacitating Heliodorus himself. However, Onias intercedes on Heliodorus's behalf, offering an atonement sacrifice to spare his life. Witnessing the power of the Almighty, Heliodorus departs, humbled and awestruck. Upon his return, when the king inquires about sending another envoy to Jerusalem, Heliodorus relays his first-hand experience, affirming that the heavenly dweller protects the city and will thwart any attempts to harm it. Simon, known for his deceitful ways, attempts to shift blame onto Onias, accusing him of treachery. Despite Simon's false accusations, Onias refrains from retaliating and instead contemplates seeking intervention from the king due to Simon's persistent deceit. However, before Onias could act, the king passes away, and his son, Antiochus Epiphanes, assumes the throne. Unlike his father, Antiochus Epiphanes harbors hostility towards Jewish customs, seeking to impose Greek culture and beliefs upon the populace. Antiochus Epiphanes, sometimes dubbed Epiphanes Epimenes or the Mad One, aligns himself with Onias' brother Jason, who offers the king a substantial sum of silver in exchange for permission to promote Greek culture among the Jewish population. In a troubling turn of events, Antiochus appoints Jason as the high priest, setting a dangerous precedent of political interference in religious affairs. Jason, driven by his ambition and greed, complies with the king's demands, systematically erasing the concessions granted to the Jews and introducing Greek customs that violate their religious laws. Many Jews, swayed by the allure of the Greek lifestyle, begin to forsake their faith. The corruption deepens when Jason's associate Menelaus surpasses Jason's bribery and secures the position of high priest for himself. Jason, realizing he is outmatched, flees into exile, while Menelaus assumes the role of high priest and continues his embezzlement from the temple treasury. Despite Menelaus's efforts to hide his crimes, Onias carefully documents the theft and publicly accuses Menelaus. In a tragic turn of events, Menelaus orchestrates Onias' assassination, hiring an assassin named Andronicus to carry out the deed. Even Antiochus Epiphanes is disturbed by Onias' murder, acknowledging his integrity and honorable conduct. In a display of justice, Antiochus orders the execution of Onias' assassin, Andronicus, at the site of the crime. However, Menelaus evades detection and continues his reign of corruption alongside his brother Lysimachus. When the people finally uncover Lysimachus's misdeeds and confront Menelaus with charges of corruption, he resorts to bribery, persuading Ptolemy, the son of Dormens, to intercede on his behalf with King Antiochus Epiphanes. As a result, Menelaus evades punishment, while the innocent suffer unjust consequences. Despite the people's protests, Menelaus remains in power as the high priest, carrying out his reign of corruption and blasphemy. Judas Maccabees, who had managed to escape from danger earlier, now stepped up to lead a resistance against the oppressors to save his people. His success stemmed from his strong faith in the Lord, much like the great leaders of Israel before him. In the old days, the Israelites relied on the Ark of the Covenant for confidence in battle but now they were learning to trust directly in the Lord. They showed concern for others who were suffering, putting their needs before their own. Judas and his warriors triumphed over the Greek forces, despite facing tough odds. Two of the king's governors joined forces to crush the Maccabean rebellion and sell the Jews into slavery. Meanwhile, news from outside revealed 
that the Seleucid kings were facing defeats against a rising power, the Romans, and owed them tribute in some of their territories. When Judas learned of an impending attack, some of his men, gripped by fear and lacking faith, deserted. However, those who remained were strengthened, perhaps inspired by the bravery of Eleazar and the martyrdom of the mother and her seven sons. They sold their possessions to prepare for battle, not just for themselves, but for the sake of the Lord and his covenant with his people. Judas rallied his troops with a powerful speech, urging them to trust in the Lord's strength. While the enemy had weapons, the Lord could overcome any obstacle. He reminded them of past victories against great odds and read from the holy book to bolster their spirits. In the ensuing battle, Judas's men defeated Nicanor's army and the remaining enemies fled. They rested on the Sabbath and shared the spoils of war with those most in need, showing mercy as they prayed to the Lord for his kindness. Despite his defeat, Nicanor recognized the strength of the Jewish people and acknowledged them as a force to be reckoned with. Because they followed their leader's laws, they were left in peace. In the concluding chapter, the Jewish community decided to commemorate this battle annually during the festival of Purim, a celebration dating back to the heroic deeds of Mordecai and Esther. A journey through history and canonization. It doesn't seem like the apocryphal books, such as the first and second books, of Maccabees were neatly recorded and preserved for us to read today. A lot of readings from ancient times have been lost, leaving gaps in our understanding of history. However, it appears that the Jewish Bible was divided into three main sections when it was canonized. First, there's the Torah, which consists of the initial five books. Then there are the prophets, followed by a section known as the writings. This final part, containing various books like Psalms and Proverbs, was likely the last to be officially recognized as part of the canon, possibly around the time of Jesus. Interestingly, some of these apocryphal books were originally written in Hebrew. Evidence of this can be found in the Qumran scrolls, where fragments of these texts exist. For instance, Sirach, also known as Ecclesiasticus, includes a prologue stating that it was initially written in Hebrew, but translated into Greek for the benefit of Greek-speaking Jews in Egypt. This suggests that these texts were compiled in Egypt, where Greek was commonly used among the upper class. It's fascinating to think about how ancient communities struggled to distinguish between what should be considered part of their sacred scripture and what should not. Unlike Christians, who have a single book containing the entire Bible, Jews traditionally kept their sacred texts as separate scrolls in synagogues. This practice reflects a different approach to religious literature and preservation. The Apocrypha books were indeed part of the Bible, but the way they were included wasn't the same as it is today. Long ago, instead of having one complete book, people had separate scrolls containing various writings. This arrangement made it a bit unclear which books were considered scripture and which were not. In places like Egypt, where Greek was commonly spoken, there was even more uncertainty about the status of certain books, like those we now call the Apocrypha. This uncertainty extended to early Christians as well. Before the mid-300s, each church had its collection of writings. These collections might include Paul's letters and the Gospels, but other books were treated more individually. It wasn't until around the 330s that we saw the first complete Bible as we know it today. However, it was a massive volume, not something an individual would own, but rather kept in the church. Because each Bible had to be written by hand, it was much larger and more bulky than the printed Bibles we have today. The fact that these writings weren't all bound together in one book led to ongoing questions about which books truly belonged in the Bible and which didn't. This uncertainty persisted for centuries, contributing to differing opinions among different Christian groups. As for Luther, he questioned the status of the Apocrypha and ultimately placed these books between the Old and New Testaments, recognizing their historical value but not considering them on the same level as the rest of the Bible. He didn't consider them to be scripture. In the Catholic and Orthodox Bibles, these books are scattered throughout, but he gathered them together and set them aside, mainly as useful reading material. He believed that they could offer encouragement and insight, but he didn't view them as on the same level as the rest of the Bible. However, it's worth noting that his judgments aren't necessarily shared by everyone. While some aspects of these books can be informative historically, 
They may contain elements that don't align with the teachings of the Old or New Testament. For example, in one of the books of Maccabees, there's a story about the Jewish army suffering a defeat and discovering that the soldiers who died were wearing amulets with idols. This leads them to pray for the dead, which some churches practice, but it doesn't necessarily align with biblical teachings. These books provide insights into the historical context of the times, but they may not always align perfectly with biblical doctrine. The Council of Trent played a significant role in shaping the public perception of these books. During the Reformation, most Protestants agreed with Luther's stance that the Hebrew Old Testament and Greek New Testament were the only true scriptures, considering the rest as the Apocrypha. However, the Council of Trent, held by the Catholic Church, affirmed the canonicity of these additional books. They declared them as part of God's Word, though they may have been viewed as secondary to the rest of the Bible. Despite some attempts to address abuses within the Church, the Catholics continued to use these books in their religious practice. What are your thoughts on the first and second books of Maccabees? Let us know your opinion in the comments below.